Rolex is one of the biggest names in watches. No matter the country, most people can recognize a Rolex. And as far as brand recognition goes, it doesn't get much better than that. But how did the company go from being founded by an orphan to the billion dollar empire it is today? The history of Rolex began in 1905, when Hans Wildorf set up the company with his brother-in-law, Alfred Davis. The brand originally started in England, but it moved to Switzerland not much later. Hans had the idea and Alfred had the money, so working together seemed like a no-brainer. What is surprising though is that Hans was a German orphan. He wasn't English nor Swiss and watchmaking certainly didn't run in his family. Hans was born in Kumbach in northern Bavaria in 1881. He was born in the middle of three children to a successful middle-class family. His grandparents were wealthy, and his parents owned an ironmonger in Kumbach. Thanks to this, young Hans spent the early years of his life relatively carefree, but when he turned 12, disaster struck twice. Both of his parents died shortly one after the other. In a brief period of time, Hans and his siblings became orphans. His aunt and uncle took custody of the kids and they promptly sent them to a boarding school in Coburg. While they had done this to ensure that the kids would receive a good school education, it was a dreadful experience for Hans, and he was very unhappy. To keep his mind occupied, he focused on his schoolwork, and he quickly became quite proficient at reading, writing, and speaking in English. Little did he know, this would later become very useful. After many unhappy years, Hans finally graduated from school, and at the age of 19, he moved to La Chaux de Fons in Switzerland in search of a better life. Back then, La Chaux de Fons was a premier watchmaking location. This made it the ideal place to gain exclusive experience, and it was here that Hans dived into the world of watches for the very first time. After working for a pearl merchant, he got a job with a growing watch company called Kuno Corten. The reason why he was hired despite not having any watchmaking experience? Well, he could read and write English, and he could therefore answer correspondence from the British Empire and America. While working for Kuno Corten, Hans became fascinated with watch movements and their accuracy. And this was the beginning of his lifelong passion. After working for Kuno Corten, Hans felt it was time to start his own career in the watch world. He moved to London and found a suitable partner for his project, his brother-in-law, Alfred Davis. Together, they founded Wilsdorf and Davis in 1905. By now, Hans was 24 years old. The company originally imported inner watch parts housed them in British cases, and sold them to jewelers. Through this initial success, the duo saw the potential for developing their own brand, and three years later, they secured the Rolex name. Hans wanted a short name that would be both easy to remember, as well as easy to say, in any language. While the brand originally started in London, they quickly opened an office in Switzerland, and Hans began dreaming of a wristwatch that was elegant, durable, and precise. You see, men had begun wearing watches on their wrists instead of in their pockets in the early 1900s, but it swiftly became clear that wristwatches would lead much harsher lives. Pocket watches were sheltered inside clothing, and they were therefore largely spared from exposure to moisture, rain, and dust. Wristwatches were much more vulnerable, however, they were commonly regarded as a fragile item of women's fashion. In addition, they weren't very precise yet. These drawbacks were not lost on Hans. He noted that the wristwatches of the time were something of a laughingstock among men. Yet he also felt that they had a lot of potential, and he foresaw that they could become not only elegant, but also reliable, both in terms of durability and accuracy. Seeing an appeal for precision in timekeeping, Hans set out to continuously improve the movements of his watches. 
and his efforts were eventually rewarded when Rolex became the first wristwatch to carry the Swiss certificate of chronometric precision in 1910. But always striving for perfection, Hans didn't stop here. Besides being precise, he wanted his watches to be robust too, and more than anything, he wanted Rolex to be known around the world. This would require some serious out-of-the-box thinking. Hans's genius was not only in the development of technically sophisticated watches, but also in their marketing. He knew how to present his inventions to the public in the best possible way, and during the next decades, some unusual stunts took place. It began in 1926, when the waterproof Oyster case was introduced. The innovative case was supposed to be water and dustproof, and they put it to the test by giving one to Mercedes Glitze. Mercedes was a British professional swimmer who set out to become the first woman to swim across the English Channel. And during this brave feat of hers, Hans had her wear the original Oyster. Unfortunately for Mercedes, her record attempt failed due to the miserable weather conditions, and after spending more than 15 hours in the icy waters between France and Great Britain, she was brought back to the coast on a vessel. Her Rolex, however, remained completely intact, and despite the hours of immersion in cold seawater, it kept accurate time. The arduous swim earned huge popular acclaim, and to add to the publicity, Rolex put fish tanks in shop windows with the Oyster submerged to further demonstrate its waterproof qualities. Hans also cleverly used other historic opportunities to show off his products. When pilots first flew over Mount Everest in 1933, the crew was equipped with Rolex watches, proving their efficiency in the air. Twenty years later, Sir Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay wore an Oyster Perpetual when they became the first humans to reach the summit of Mount Everest. And if reaching the top of the world wasn't enough, Rolex also ventured into the deep, dark depths of the ocean. In the 50s, deep-sea diving was becoming a popular sport, and in 1960, the Triesta was launched into the deepest point of the Earth. This would be the fifth and deepest dive, and what was attached to the outside of it? nothing other than a Rolex Deep Sea Special. The world was impressed, and little by little the most unexpected characters would be spotted with a Rolex around their wrist. What do Pope John Paul II, the 14th Dalai Lama, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, James Bond, and Warren Buffett have in common? They all love a nice Rolex. That James Bond and Warren Buffett love Rolex doesn't seem odd, but that even communist leaders and diehard anti-capitalists are Rolex fans might raise some eyebrows. What's important to know is that while Rolex has always been at the forefront of technological innovation, back in the 60s it wasn't nearly the kind of status symbol it is today. For much of its history, a Rolex was a functional tool rather than a decorative accessory, and around this time, Rolexes also weren't as insanely expensive as they are now. In 1957, a stainless steel Submariner date would have cost you $180. Adjusted for inflation, this is around $1,500 these days. That same model will set you back more than $10,000. But why is this? Well, you may be surprised to learn that it's largely thanks to a crisis that Rolex managed to use to its advantage. Between 1970 and 1980, a so-called quartz crisis was taking place. At least, that's how the Swiss watch industry called it. In Japan, they probably just know it as the quartz era. It began on Christmas Day in 1969, when the Japanese watch brand Seiko introduced the world's first quartz wristwatch, the Astron. It was a huge success, and many other brands quickly followed in their footsteps. Instead of having a mechanical movement, Quartz watches were battery-powered. These watches were more precise and cost less to make, and their proliferation decimated the Swiss watch industry. All around the world, people switched from mechanical watches to quartz watches, and from one day to another, Swiss watchmakers risked going out of business. Accepting that they could never compete with Asian watchmakers in terms of price, Swiss brands like Rolex 
decided to offer something else. Their heritage, status, and craftsmanship. Throughout the 80s, Rolex invested heavily in building the prestigious brand image they have today. Back when air travel was still a glamorous activity, they placed Rolex clocks in airports and they signed sponsorship deals with posh leisure activities like tennis and golf, equestrianism, yachting, and the Viennese Philharmonic Orchestra. Thanks to these marketing tactics, Rolex managed to stay relevant despite the quartz craze, and over time, their watches became objects of desire, not of utility. Hans himself was no longer around to witness it all, though. In fact, he had already long withdrawn himself from the watch business. After the death of his wife, Lawrence Crotty, in 1945, he transferred the responsibility for the company to the Hans Wildor Foundation. He passed away 15 years later in Geneva at the age of 79. And as he did not have any children, the company ownership and control were passed to the trust too. Today, Rolex is one of the most prestigious brands on earth and the leading luxury watch manufacturer in the world. Over 2,000 Rolex watches are produced per day, generating billions in sales year after year. To this day, the company is still owned and controlled by the private Hans Wildor Foundation. And that's also why Rolex isn't on the stock exchange. The brand's prestige is built on innovation, precision, and functionality. And it is a perfect example of first working on your reputation and then letting your reputation do the work. Did you know Rolex was originally created by an orphan? Share it in the comments. And if there are any horology buffs out there, feel free to let us know which interesting details you think should have been added to this video. In the mood for more inspiring business stories? Then take a look at our channel.